Hello, everyone. Welcome to Market Talks. I'm Ray Salmond, head of markets at Cointelegraph. And here on the show, we discuss the latest and what's shaping the markets with valuable insights from industry leaders, traders, and influencers. Our guest today is Mike McGlone, who is the senior macro strategist at Bloomberg Intelligence. Hey, Mike, thanks for coming on today. Um, you're a repeat guest here at Cointelegraph, so I know that our audience is quite familiar with your insights, and I'm sure looking forward to today's conversation. Yes, I enjoy coming on, and I appreciate uh, speaking to you. Let's uh, figure out what we're going to be doing in markets. Yeah, yeah, I guess we should just jump into it. So there's a lot going on. I think the headline topic at the moment is the debt ceiling debate between um, House leader Kevin McCarthy and um, the Biden administration. What are your thoughts and concerns on the current debt ceiling battle? And um, how do you think it'll turn out? Well, I think markets are going to make them come to terms, the Democrats and the Republicans, to basically just raise the debt ceiling. Um, but unfortunately, it might take what it did in 2011, a decent swoon in risk assets like the stock market as we speak. Um, we're recording this on Wednesday around 11. The stock market's down 1%, started going down this week. And I think that's what's going to take, particularly after it's been up a lot this year. That's the thing about all risk assets have been up after they were down last year. So I see what's happening is the debt ceiling is part of the macro lose-lose for all risk assets as we tilt towards recession. Um, but as far as the debt ceiling, I'm glad we're not using the word default because there will not be a default. I'm getting kind of sick of hearing three secretaries and official people use that word and our debt because that's an oxymoron. It will never happen. They may delay a payment because of politics, but um, let's remember what's going on here. This is just part of the discourse of American politics. It's what makes us great, but this is part of the pain we have to go through to come to agreement in terms rather than being led by one autocratic leader who tells us all what to do. Are you convinced that a uh, delayed payment would not be interpreted by the market as a default? No, I mean, let the market, it's not, it's not, it's just politics. I mean, we have the world's reserve currency. We can print as many as we want. We can just do a, some treasury transactions with the Fed and can we prove how much we can create if we need to during the COVID crisis. And we've created 40, increased the money supply by 40% during the crisis. So, no, it's just um, politics. It's posturing. And there might be a delayed payment. But it have all you all, everybody who has U.S. dollar debt will be paid in dollars. It's just a question of time. And then we'll get past this and we'll get over it. Hopefully we'll set up some kind of new laws. We don't have to go through this an anymore. So you've described the current situation as a lose-lose for risk assets and possibly yeah. for equities. What do you mean by that? Yeah. Well, um, the situation right now is we're tilting towards a recession. The market is priced for the worst being over in assets, stock market, cryptos, Bitcoin. And that means the risk is that the worst is not over. We go to a severe recession. That means all risk assets go down. So my base case is we're looking at the S&P 500 right now uh, around 4,100. I think it goes to 3,000. It's not a big deal in a typical recession. Tip the last two recessions from peak to trial, it dropped 50%. And one of those indicators lately has been commodities. Commodities are showing that we are in severe deflationary reset at the moment, and the Federal Reserve is still tightening. So basically, all the lessons of history and markets show that we are in a very bad place for risk assets. The question you have to ask yourself and everybody who's holding risk assets, stocks, cryptos, the two top cryptos that are riskiest assets, is what stops this reversion towards lower levels. And it's not the Fed. Right now, I look at the WIRP function on the terminal, on the Bloomberg terminal, and it still shows the Fed's going to be tightening in June. It's just an oxymoron with a, a banking crisis, credit contraction, and collapsing commodities. I mean, to me, the lessons of 1930 are all here. And we're going to look back from the future, I think, and say, well, that was silly. So I look at it as market just going back to what they normally do. We've had this hopium kind of bounce. And now we're going back to the what I think is the base case for me, and that is a pretty severe economic reset slash contraction. Like I said, the Bloomberg Commodity Index is down 26% on the annual basis. That's a sign of a lack of demand pull 
from all of the whole world. And there's only two times in history it's been down more than that. The last time was the great financial crisis in the depths of that. And then before that was the 1981-82 recession in the depths of recession. And we've never had the Fed tighten in that environment. So that is part of why I see what's happening. And also risk assets get way off size. This bounce in Bitcoin from 1530 was great and Ethereum from 1,000 to 2,000 was great, but it's within a broader case where the stock market, the, S the NASDAQ bounced 25% on this hope of a soft landing when I think we're just going to get a hard landing and it's going to go back down and make new lows. Okay. I'd like to present you with the what if this time it's different question that some investors have in mind, right? So in previous, let's say, Bitcoin market cycles, Bitcoin has kind of been the signal of where equities might go, i.e. Bitcoin price started to correct from its all-time high right as the Fed and Jerome Powell began to hint that rate hikes were coming. I think this was in early 2021 um, when, when he started to say that rate hikes are a realistic part of a potential policy shift off of quantitative easing and zero interest rate environments. In the meantime, as Bitcoin began to correct, um, you know, in anticipation of Fed interest rates hikes, the Dow and the SPX kept notching new all-time highs almost daily. So let's fast forward to the present where Bitcoin is up 64.5% for the year. Um, the Fed is 10 interest rate hikes deep into its current monetary policy. Inflation is beginning to taper off. And the Fed has acknowledged that a pause in rate hikes is within consideration as they're approaching this terminal rate. So how do you frame this reality with your expectation that beyond the debt ceiling debate, risk assets still remain a lose-lose category? Um, Bitcoin is still up, you know, 64.5% for the year. Equities markets are performing well. The Fed is suggesting that they're going to cut rates, which all risk-loving investors are like, great, that means a reversion to printing, which so, means risk sentiments on and assets like crypto have to go up, right? This is the belief that's out there. So what's your take on this? So for the first point is the Fed is not suggesting they will um, lower rates. They are jawboning that they were raise rates. The markets are priced for them to lower rates. Um, Fed funds are still priced from the hike at the next the June meeting and then potentially cut by the end of the year. There's only one way, I think, primary way for the Fed to cut rates by the end of the year. That's for risk assets to go down or those Fed fund futures could be wrong. I think it's more likely the futures will be right and risk assets will go down and induce foul commodities. So the key thing to remember is you're right. Bitcoin is one of the top leading indicators on the planet, traded 24 seven and it has been. It led on the way down last year and it's led on the way up this year. And I think it peaked around 30,000 and Ethereum peaked around 2000 and are heading back down. So. As we speak right now, Bitcoin's down 4% on the day. Um, and that's just fully what I expected. Before the crisis, it was averaging around $7,000. It pumped up to 60,000. Right now it's at 26,000. It could easily head towards 7,000. So to me, that's the key thing to remember and watch is yes, you're right. It is a good leading indicator and it peaked around 30,000 and it's heading lower. The key thing I have right now is there is just, when I was at the Bitcoin 2023 conference in Miami, the sense I get from everybody, the sense I get, and this is my job to sense markets, is the worst is over. I get that in the stock market. It makes me tweak my trader's hat and point out the data that it's, okay, well, what if the risk is that it's not over and we just tilt down towards what really happens in recessions? Now, Bitcoin's never faced a recession. First one, here it is. It's never faced a true bear market in the stock market where the stock market doesn't just go down 20% and the Fed saves it. It goes down 40% and the Fed doesn't save it. That's what I think we're doing now. And we'll see how we come out of that. And the key thing to remember is that some of the best performing assets on a one-year basis are is gold. So I've fully been watching that gold Bitcoin ratio for a while. Now, um, it's actually the Bitcoin gold ratio because Bitcoin typically outperforms. It's bounced recently, so I fully expect it to roll back over. A key thing I watch is like leading indicators and bank deposits and money supply. The bottom line for all risk assets is don't fight the Fed and don't fight liquidity. And they are negative right now. So, and we've had a bounce. So look at it simplistically as an option market, as someone who runs money which I used to do and I used to have clients that did it. You see the markets priced for all that good hopium? 
and so what's the risk is that it doesn't happen so you want to structure positions particularly where you make many x's if it doesn't happen and i think that's what we're doing right now a good indication of that everything going down is copper if you look at the price of copper copper is known as the metal of a phd in economics the price of copper on the screens right now is about two dollars three dollars and sixty cents a pound now, if you overlay that with the S&P 500 divided by 1,000, since 2000, they've been about the same price. So right now, the price of copper implies that the S&P 500 should drop to about 3,600, 10% or so. I fully expect that to happen. And what's going to stop that? It's not the Fed. The Fed is still priced for tightening. So the bottom line, as I started saying over a year ago, is don't fight the Fed. And the fact that we're still saying don't fight the Fed with us heading towards a recession means you're supposed to sell rallies in risk assets. And guess what? We just had a decent rally in risk assets. Right. That makes sense. What are your views on de-dollarization? Because that was all the rage in the last month or two. Everyone's talking about uh, the dollar is going to lo lose its reserve status. All the BRICs are now settling trade in their own sovereign currency, and you know it's politically convenient to them, uh, like uh, the king of Saudi Arabia and some other monarchs. It's it's politically convenient for them to talk about settling trade and shaking off dollar hegemony and yada yada yada. But what's your view on de-dollarization? Is it a threat to Americans? Oh, not at all. It's actually entertaining when you've heard it. I mean, I started in the business in 88 and I've heard it so many times you get kind of immune to it. I'm like, yeah, good luck with that one. It's like people shorting treasuries when the, and thinking treasury yields are going to go up when the deficit goes up. It's just been a losing trade for decades. So here's a key fact about, let's talk about de-dollarization. These are enemies of the U.S. typically. Let's talk about the men, main two have made themselves kind of autocratically led regimes, which is typically not good for a currency. China and Russia are top two. Um, and sure, I'm like, good luck with that one. They have nowhere near, first of all, what are you going to replace the dollar with? A reserve currency that's close to the dollar, maybe in a 10 scale, the dollar is a 10, there might be a one in the euro, maybe a two. <laughs> Not even close. The depth of the dollar treasury market in the military in the umbrella that the dollar provides that the u.s provides is not even close so maybe someday it'll be replaced by something else right now it is being getting some decent competition from gold but the bottom line to remember from a dollar standpoint is the most significant rapidly advanced um, technology on the planet cryptos has adopted the dollar's base layer and that is something we started to point out years ago and i like to say well you know, that was completely done organic. And when you're in China and you see that, oh, wow, the most widely traded cryptos are dollar tokens, and that's nothing. In fact, the U.S. is actually pushing back on that, and they're not going for our CBDCs. You know you have to launch a central bank digital currency just to keep up with the dominance of the dollar. So I think this war has really shown how important the U.S. and the dollar is. And then you have to look at yourself. As, so, okay, there's Europe's been having a hot war again, it's being invaded by the Russians. And you have to think to yourself, okay, well, do I want to become under the auspices of the um, leadership, autocratic leadership of Mr. Putin or Mr. Z, or do I want to kind of stick with the umbrella of protection from the US and the dollar? And I think every rational money manager and person on the planet says, yeah, okay, US ain't perfect, but it's sure better than um, autocratic leaders who like to invade foreign current countries and get support from auto, other autocratic leaders who have major exporters. So I'm not worried about it, but again, it's one of those things I like to say, I'm trend your friend, good luck with that one. Um, and that's my bullish goal, but still big picture, the dollar versus a basket, I'll end with this, right? The dollar versus a basket of trade weighted currencies going back to the seventies, the, the US Fed measure only goes down after it goes up a lot. Why? Because there's nothing even close to the dollar, particularly when you measure it versus other currencies. Yes, this debate, um, this debt ceiling is an issue, but the one thing about the debt ceiling, it shows how strong we are because we fight it out. We openly um, discourse everything in this country. And as Churchill says, we come to the right conclusion. You don't get that in China and Russia. And it's part of the reason those, co those economies, I think, I look at China is heading towards um, kind of an example of um, peak Japan in the 90s and peak Soviet Union. So free and open markets will prevail and de-dollarization is clickbait, possibly even hogwash. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I like the way you put that, clickbait, it's perfect. It gets the readers. <laughs> it does. Uh, do you see any similarities between Bitcoin and crypto's big unwind in 2022? 
and the potential unwind in commodities, stocks, and the dollar. Uh, I've heard yeah. you speak about a big unwind coming or being possible in future years. Um, so I'm wondering if there's an analog between crypto's giant unwinding that we saw in the last two years and what you might see um, within other markets. It's in the process. The giant unwind got started with the peak in 2022 and the plunge. And we've had a bounce this year, just like we did in 1930. And we're going to go back down is a ways my base case and all risk assets and cryptos are the riskiest assets. It's just Bitcoin's the least risky crypto. So one good indication lately recent was a Pepe coin. It was just silly, reminding me of Shibu Inu in 2021. It was one of those things when, okay, sometimes a bell does ring. That's a silly, stupid speculation. That was a good example. It also happened as Bitcoin peaked around 30,000 and Ethereum peaked around 2000. And there's just so much purging that's still needed in the massive speculation in space. Speculation, um, Pepe was a sign of that. So I look at it as um, we need to see some significant divergent strength in number one, Bitcoin versus the stock market. Now, we haven't really seen that yet. Look at Bitcoin was up, um, like you mentioned, it's up about 70% then a year for a while. The Bloomberg Galaxy Crypto Index was up about 50%, and NASDAQ was up about 25%. That's a bounce in a bear market the way I see it. And there's a good solid reason for that bear market. We are seeing in the midst of the biggest liquidity dump in history on the back of the biggest liquidity pump in history. And that all the lessons of history point to risk assets and big booms all come on the back of liquidity and then busts come when it's being um, taken away. That's what's happening right now. You just look at bank deposits, you look at contracting, um, contracting credit, you look at money supply, you look at the Fed, um, and commodities. Commodities are one of the most significant leading indicators of deflation. And I like to point out the Bloomberg Commodity Index, like I said, is down 26% on a one-year basis. That's very extreme, but it's also highly correlated with things like PPI. Let's look at what's happening with Deflation. What's the number one rule that um, Ben Bernanke pointed out in his essays on the Great Recession is the things that the Fed and central banks did wrong was contracting money supply in the 30s and late in when when markets were collapsing. We're doing that. And um, a good example of that is producer price index. The producer price index, PPI, year over year measure is dropping at the fastest pace in history since 1948 peaked around 18% last year, it's 2%. And by the time we get to July, July 13th, the June number will probably be a negative year over year. And that's about the time our chief economist, Anna Wong, expects the US to tilt towards a recession. And then the key question is, typically what it takes to get out of these things is a long and variable lag to Federal, Federal Reserve easing, and they're not easing. We're also seeing that's happening in China. All the data out of China is becoming disappointing. Why? First of all, they mismanaged the, the the um, uh, uh, the uh, pandemic, and now they're dealing with okay, shoot, do we we kind of supported this country that invaded another country, so the Europeans don't like us, Americans don't like us, and who are our major exporting countries? U.S. and Europe, and what are they doing? No, they're tilting towards recession. It's just a global co a collapse in economic activity. Commodities are showing that. That's pretty complex, and I have a question that's a bit of a diversion. So shoot, let's do it. Let's get something happier. <laughs> Okay, employers are pretty much telling, pensions are hard to come by these days, and employers um, are pretty much telling their employees, go out and manage your own investments. And brokerages are doing the same. They're marketing services to where you can be your own trader. Charles Schwab is doing it, T. Rowe Price is doing it. Um, Robinhood has been you know, really strong in that push. Be your own trader, do your own analysis, manage your own retirement. I think that that's very difficult for your average retail investor um, who's not sitting behind a Bloomberg terminal and having a, a career in <laughs> economics and in trading and whatnot. So um, when we're talking about inching toward recession or a giant unwind or a huge deleveraging within markets, what are like three or four metrics or very simple practices that you're standard investor can use to kind of navigate the markets and develop an understanding on what's happening and use that to inform their actions. What would you suggest so, to just a random person off the street? Right now, 
um, I don't give investment advice, but I exactly. will. Exactly. Let's go. Let's go past standard. Oh, you got to diversify, and you're in it for long haul and dollar cost average. Let's go past that. Right now, in the U.S. government, to you know, you're getting 4.3 percent. That's pretty compelling. It got up to 5% for a little while. And to me, every rational human being on the planet realized that, okay, so in two years, I'm going to get guaranteed 10% back in my money. Do it. Right now, you're getting almost 9% back in your money guaranteed. As this guy Malone says, we're tilting towards recession in the U.S. stock market. Just recently, it was the most expensive ever versus the rest of the world, versus housing, versus sales, and versus GDP. It's probably a good time to say, maybe I should underweight equities. Now, that's for me right now, I say just... U.S. Treasury, two notes are, keep it simple. Okay, as you, you might have used that word by mistake. Always invest, never trade from most people. I saw that in the trading bits. Um, and the bottom line is I look at right now is I think it's a time to be underweight risk assets and overweight things like gold and treasury bonds. And that's my view. Um, that's far as a long term. Um, when that happens, typically when too many people, non-professionals run their own money, they usually often mark peaks in the market. And I think that's what we did in 2021. Throwing all that money at people and people going to Robinhood and trading cryptos, will we look back in history as creating the bubble that is bursting. The key point is right now that bubble is still bursting. We've had a bounce in that bubble and the liquidity is being taken away. So I look at it simplistically as more of a tactical orientated person is this is a period where I think it's going to be more like 1930. In 1929, the market went down 50 percent and it bounced from that low to the peak in 1930, and then the rest was history. The key thing I always say to myself is don't fight the Fed or liquidity. And liquidity is still negative at the moment. And typically, what it takes is a lower plateau or a decent correction, a decent pullback in markets for that liquidity pump to be turned back on again. And it's still a rug pull. So a common retort I hear from people when they're advised to go invest in CDs, treasuries, bonds, and such is given this high rate inflation, you're not beating inflation. So sure, you're getting 5% on not that true. three to six month CD, but with inflation where it is now, it's nothing, you know, it's really just 1%. Should investors, and of course, this is not an investment advice at all, but should investors ignore this short-term high inflation? and lock in these rates at 5%, 4.5% on uh, treasuries and on CDs and just forego the fact that, sure, inflation is still running a bit hot right now, but by the time you're ready to redeem but, but, this thing, it won't matter? It all depends on the individual investor. And we all know in the long term, dollar cost averaging in the stock market has been one of the best things to do over time. That makes sense. The bottom line is, if you look at inflation on a 12-month basis, sure, it's spiked. But like I said, the PPI is collapsing. All the forward-looking measures of inflation are absolutely collapsing. I fully expect a year from now when we're speaking, we'll in a, be in severe deflationary recession. Um, that's my bias. McGlone might be wrong. You can blame him. If you look at inflation measures on a 120-month basis, it Piked, it spiked, it's all had a little spike and it's going back down. Like I said, this is a collapse in the forward looking measures of inflation. So let's look at um, personal consumption expenditures. That's the number one thing the Fed watches. Fed funds is now above that level, still rising. Around, it's around five and a quarter, and the big per personal consumption expenditures has dropped below 5%. So what's happening is we're heading towards disinflation in those measures that are lagging. We're heading towards deflation in all the leading measures, and the Fed's still tightening. That's a train wreck waiting to happen. It's just how it's all happened in history, and maybe it's different this time, is what I say for people who are aggressively long-risk assets. I'm like, good luck. Maybe it is different this time. Yet, you know, when we were at this stage back in 2007 or 8, Fed was already, about 2008, when, we, when commodities were down this much, Fed fund, you could, and the two-year note, we were maybe able to get around 2%. Now you can get double that. And that's the point is what was happening, I think, before the crisis, before COVID is just restarting, but with from a lot higher plateau. So from investor standpoint, if there's ever been a time to hunker down and, and underweight risk assets and overweight simple U.S. government too. You know, say thank you, U.S. government, for that yield. I think now's the time. Mm -hmm. It's dangerous to be biased, high risk, high volatility assets. Um, perhaps like Bitcoin right uh, now. It, a Maybe good time, a, a good time to be to be biased for those is when they drop and get cheap. Now they drop and, and got cheap last year, but to me, now we've had a bounce. That's been a trading bounce. It's when they go down mm -hmm. and stay down, and a lot of the analysts like. 
Remember last year we heard about that super cycle in the stock market? And I'm sorry, in commodities, yeah. and they all turned out to be wrong. Well, that's when you put in peaks. It's when the markets go down and all you hear about, oh, it's going to stay down. It's diff it's going to stay down for a long time. Typically, it takes a few years. I mean, I remember some really bad bear markets. That's usually what it takes. And cryptos, I think, are still early days for that period of maximum disdain. Right, right, right. Regarding your views on treasuries, bonds and such, we've seen max, we've seen kind of like historic or record inflows into money market accounts in the last, since the bank crisis started and Silvergate yeah. blew up, and SVG blew up. Yeah. Money market accounts are incredibly lucrative. Banks can't match that yield. How do we avoid another full blown crisis in the banking industry, especially with the continuous rollout of Fed rate hikes? Well, Ray, I think I appreciate that question because the question answers the question. There's no way to avoid it right now except one key thing. What caused it? Rapidly rising interest rates and a mismatch in duration and now declining asset values. That is still happening. In fact, it's increasing. Since the banking crisis really hit the tape in March, the Fed has raised rates twice. I think we're going to look back at that from history and say, didn't you learn that lesson in 1930 of, of pulling contract line into a bank credit crisis? We're accelerating that crisis. You're pointing out the money moving to money, to money markets. It's coming out of the banks, which means from a fractional reserve standpoint, they have to pull back in lending. Um, it's just, it's, it's a train wreck. Um, so I don't see what stops it other than what caused it to reverse, and that is massive liquidity in the system. And the thing is, the Fed will never ease with the ease they have in the past. And even my, like my colleague, Anna Wong, who's our chief economist, said these sticky levels of inflation, like I mentioned, personal consumption expenditures, are what's going to keep the Fed from easing anytime soon, even though from an economist model standpoint, it shows that we should start to be easing soon, is what my economist economic model shows at Bloomberg Intelligence, yet they can't because those lagging measures. Like I say, well, look at PPI. PPI right now, Fed funds, if you subtract out Fed funds, is a negative number, which shows clear signs of recession. And the question is, a mild recession or a bad recession? I like to do lessons of history. Well, when you have a massive pump like that, you should expect a reciprocal dump. And the market's just priced for, meh, simple old, simple old uh, soft landing. A few quick fire questions and then we'll wrap up. In 2023, is cash still king? Yep. Oh yeah, it's gonna be deflation. And I fully expect, we're seeing deflation in commodities. We're going to see deflation in PPI in a few months, I fully expect. And then all the other lagging measures, housing, condos, land, everything, stock market should continue towards this deflationary trajectory. We've had a little bounce. So yeah, there's nothing wrong with cash that earns 5%. That's a wonderful thing. Think about it. Gold doesn't earn 5%. Stock market doesn't earn 5%. Maybe you get lucky. Those Bitcoin doesn't earn 5%. That's just an overwhelming pressure on risk assets is the fact in the T-bill you get 5%. Mm -hmm. In 2024, will cash be king? Probably. It depends on what happens. I fully expect what we need typically, Ray, is you need to go to a lower plateau in risk assets. Now, it's happened in things like natural gas. It's happened in lumber. Um, things that get too expensive, they got to go to a lower plateau and just make it as painful and possible as possible. And typically, have to get to a decent bear market trial. And I don't think we're even near that. And what you mentioned with cash, cash is not trash, cash is 5% guarantee. Okay, might be delayed payment, but you're gonna get the payment from the US government. That means all risk assets have to go down until that resets, until I think we get to the point where that cash gets too, um, lack, it lacks competition for risk assets. And 5% is too, com or what, two or less, and it's actually declined in the stock market. Mm -hmm. In your view, what's the biggest mistake that most investors make? Oh, they buy it, um, buy at peaks and sell at trials. Trials typically is what happens. So that's what's happened in commodities last year. You had too many people getting bullish near the peak. Um, I was wrong, and I was early in that. It's come around, and that's typically what they do, and they FOMO. Um, and I think the biggest mistake investors right now are are, do, are making is expecting that the worst is over in this greatest reset in a lifetime by expecting that the worst is over in cryptos and the worst is over in the stock market. To me, that's the current mistake I think most people are making. And they've been good reason to think that because the last 
well, almost 20 years, if not more than every time the stock market was done, the Fed was there to save you. I see stock market going down, the Fed's still raising rates. This is the world has changed with COVID. We will never see the ease of ease and liquidity that we've seen in the past. And markets are going to come back to a wonderful period where it's no longer about the Fed liquidity, it was about our organic companies creating decent revenue and not the Fed just going in to save us every time it drops 20%. So that to me is a mistake I think people are making right now is they're overweight and too optimistic and too long risk assets. Interesting. They could be viewing quantitative easing, which lasted like 11 years or 12 years. They could be viewing that within the context of we take the elevator up and the stairs down. So this correction that we've seen this year and the soft landing that we might have in Q3, Q4, Q1, Q2 of next year, that is the basically stairs. We, we tumbled all the way down and hit the ground and now it's time to bounce, right? They could be looking at things within that context, um, not realizing that perhaps there's been a paradigm shift. Well, that's the thing. Paradigm shifts are difficult to measure and to um, identify until after they happen, until from the benefit of uh, from the future. But here's a key fact is from our chief economist, Anna Wong, who came out swinging on Monday's morning meeting, said, we're going to get an ugly economic situation in the second half of this year. And the key thing is our model show the Fed should start easing soon, then they won't. And when you have a one-handed economist who says things like that, who's been spot on, she started calling for this recession over a year ago, you go with. So I look at it as um, we've had a bounce, good luck. Uh, we've had the biggest pump in ever that's dumping. And cryptos are such a leading indicator for that, Ray, and they're all dumping. I mean, just Pepe mm -hmm. coined recently, like, oh gosh, more of that. So I, to me, it's not that complicated. Copper's collapsed, commodities are collapsed, the Fed's still tightening. Um, Key question is what stops this? Let's just remember, bottom line is it typically takes a long and variable lag to an aggressive amount of Federal Reserve easing. And this is historic. Um, and I'm not just Mick Gloom, I'm Mick Facts. Let's point out the facts of history and markets do not shine favorable on risk assets for a while. Okay, so there's a lot of confluence among indicators that suggests potential darker days are ahead. Right. Well, that about wraps it up. Thanks for coming on and sharing your insights. I think the greatest takeaways the audience might pinpoint on is that crypto investors and risk lovers are, um, are, are too biased towards thinking that the Fed will pivot and that risk assets will benefit from that. We are still in a bubble and that bubble is still popping and leverage within our traditional finance system and economy is still unwinding, just like we saw um, with the blow up of all the crypto funds in 2022 and 2021. So um, those are interesting insights. Um, it sounds like you believe that treasuries and bonds and money market accounts are offering, you know, decent yield and investors might consider locking that in longer term, given that darker economic and uh, deflationary times are around the corner. I, I take, you know, I think that that's good advice personally. Um, Anything else you want to share with our audience? No, I think it's a good synopsis. I really appreciate being on and I appreciate speaking to you. I'm looking forward to the next time. All right. Thank you for coming on, Mike. I appreciate it. Thank you, viewers, for tuning in to Market Talks. We're here every Thursday. Be sure to tune in to Market Talks and follow Cointelegraph to stay up to date on all the latest and breaking news.